This week on the CNET Tech Review, the Samsung Galaxy Nexus is coming sometime. Motorola dusts off the Razer brand, how to make sure Siri isn't being too helpful, and a new digital camera unlike any you've seen before. It's all coming up right now. Hi everyone, I'm Molly Wood and welcome to the CNET Tech Review where we collect our hottest videos of the week and tell you what's good and what's bad in the world of tech, plus offer our own unique tech wisdom in the form of the bottom line. Let's start things off with the good. The good news is that after a short one week delay, Samsung and Google have announced the long awaited Galaxy Nexus. It's the latest pure Android phone featuring Android 4.0 ice cream sandwich. The other good news, it looks pretty good. Here's a sneak peek, courtesy of our friends from CNET Asia. Samsung has just announced the Galaxy Nexus smartphone together with Google in Hong Kong. This new Android smartphone is the first to feature the latest ice cream sandwich operating system. Its hardware features include a dual-core 1.2 GHz processor, 1 GB RAM and near-field communications technology. Another highlight is the huge 4.65-inch touchscreen with a resolution of 1280 by 720 pixels. The new Android 4.0 OS brought many new features. Here you see a unified menu screen that puts all your apps and widgets in the same place. The camera app is now capable of panoramic images. Just use the guide and the phone will stitch the shots for you. Here's a demo of the camera speed. This is a big improvement over previous Nexus phones and will ensure you don't miss shots because of shutter lag. Buttons are all software based in Ice Cream Sandwich, so there are very few physical keys on the Galaxy Nexus. Just power and volume controls. On the back is a 5 megapixel camera and a textured back cover made with a material Samsung calls Hyperskin. We still don't know how much the Galaxy Nexus will cost, but we do know it will be available before the end of the year. Me personally, I would have liked a firmer release date, some pricing info, and maybe a pre-order site, but I guess you can't always get what you want. The Nexus may be the latest and greatest in smartphones, but there was a time when the Motorola Razr was the hot phone to have. And although that was ages ago in cell phone years, some of you who still prefer a flip phone might still be carrying one. But if the time has come to upgrade, the new Droid Razr may be just what you're looking for. Hey everyone, I'm Bonnie Ta, senior editor at CNET.com, and we're here in New York at a very special event where they have unveiled the Motorola Droid Razr. Yes, that's right, the Razr is back, but in a smartphone form. Um, and as the previous Razrs, it's very, very thin. It's 7.1 millimeters thick, so as you can see, really thin here. Uh, but a very nice feeling phone. On back, you've got a Kevlar fiber backing, um, so that's very nice and rugged. It's also water uh, repellent inside and out, so if you happen to spill some coffee or splash some water, it should be all right. On front here, you've got a 4.3 inch Super AMOLED Advanced QHD touchscreen. It's really, really gorgeous, very sharp and bright, um, you know, better than previous Motorola phones, which had just QHD displays, so very exciting there. Uh, on bottom, you've got the usual Android uh, buttons, the menu, home, back, and search. Uh, on top, you've got an HDMI port as well as a micro USB port and a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack. On back, there is an 8 megapixel camera and a can do 1080p uh, HD video. So even though this phone is very thin, it's still very feature packed and powerful. It's got a dual core 1.2 gigahertz processor as well as 4G LTE capabilities. Uh, software wise, it's running Android 2.3.5 Gingerbread. Um, a couple of things that Motorola added is Motocast, so you'll be able to stream content from your PC to your phone, uh, such as videos and music um, and photos. It's also got an application called Smart Actions, which will help you uh, aut automatically do some tasks or optimize battery life. Speaking of battery life, it has a 1780 milliamp uh, lithium ion battery, and they are saying the rated talk time is going to be 12.5 hours. So, you know, that was one of my concerns about a phone uh, this size is what would happen to battery life. But they're saying it's going to be around 12.5. So we'll have to see once we get it in uh, whether that's true or not. I'll admit when I first heard the rumors of a Droid Razor, I wasn't sure what to think about it. But now that I've had it in hand and ha have been able to play with it, it's really fast and gorgeous. Um, I'm really excited about it. And 
Hopefully it will work out in performance testing and everything else. The Motorola Droid Razor will be available for pre-orders from Verizon Wireless starting October 27th and the cost will be $299.99 so it is a little bit pricey. Uh, it will be available in stores in November but it don't have a specific date. Also available in November is the new Moto Active which they also announced today. It's a fitness and music device that also has a heart rate monitor um, and can hold about 4,000 songs and also can sync with your phone like the Droid Razor which has an app preloaded on here so you can check out your workouts and also receive text messages and see incoming calls. I'm Bonnie Cha and this has been your first look at the Motorola Droid Razor for Verizon Wireless. Okay, I admit I'm the only person on earth who really wanted this Razor to be a flip phone also, but still, I can't get over how thin it is. Now to all of you iPhone 4S users out there, take note, Siri might be cheating on you. It turns out that Siri can be used even if your phone is locked with a passcode. Now, whether you prefer to call this a feature or a security flaw is up to you. But either way, Sharon Vaknin is here to show you how to shut Siri down. Hey everyone, I'm Sharon Vaknin for CNET, and today we found a pretty bad security flaw in Siri on the iPhone 4S. If your phone ever gets in the wrong hands, anyone can activate Siri even if your phone is locked with a passcode. All you have to do is long press the home button and Siri pops right up. From there, they can do a number of things like send a text, ask for your friend's phone numbers, or find out what your address is. Siri will even display events on your calendar. Check it out. What's Chris Parker's address? Here's Chris Parker's address. Kind of freaky, right? It's only when you try to do something like access an app that Siri asks for your passcode. Give me directions to Chris Parker's address. Sharon, I can't get maps and directions while your phone's locked. You will need to unlock it first. Thankfully, though, there is a fix for this. Head to Settings, General, Passcode Lock. Enter your passcode and switch Siri to off where it says allow access to Siri when locked with the passcode. Now your phone is actually protected. Of course, by doing this, you lose the ability to quickly complete tasks with Siri when your phone is locked. But the choice between security and convenience is up to you. For more how-tos and security tips, visit howto.cnet.com and feel free to send me any questions on Twitter or my Facebook page. For CNET, I'm Sharon Vaknin, and I'll see you on the interwebs. Granted, voice commands have been accessible from the lock screen for years, but since Siri can do so much more, she's exposing a lot more of your information to tampering. Plus, it would have been nice if Apple had told us this was turned on by default. Or better yet, if they had turned it off by default. In the past, we've shown you how you can create your own ringtones using iTunes, but with the introduction of text tones in iOS 5, Brian Tong figured it was worth revisiting the process. And who am I to stand in his way? Brian Tong here with CNET.com, and one of the new features in iOS 5 allows you to use your custom ringtones as custom text tones because there's plenty of you that have reached for your phone when it was someone else who received the text message. Loser. So we're going to show you how to do it, and if you've seen our ringtones video, the process is almost exactly the same, but let's refresh your memory. So first off, let's start in iTunes and find a song like this one that I want to turn into a ringtone or text tone. Right click on the song and select get info. A window will appear with track information and you want to select the options tab and look for the start time and stop time settings. Click on the boxes next to those settings for now. Now I know where I want my custom tone to start so I'll enter in a start time and a stop time. There's a 40 seconds max duration for iTunes custom tones and if you want to use sound effects or sound bites from your favorite movie, just make sure you have an audio file that's playable in iTunes. Once you've set the time, Press OK, then go to Advanced on the main menu bar and select Create AAC version. iTunes will create the shorter version of your song below the original file. You'll see the duration time, and you want to drag and drop that version onto your desktop to make a copy. Now, there's a little housekeeping we need to take care of first. If the option to create AAC version is not available in iTunes, go to your Preferences, and in the General tab, find the section that says When you insert a CD, 
click on the import settings and then select import using AAC encoder. The option should now appear in the menu bar. You also want to go back to the original audio file in iTunes and then check off the start and stop time so that it plays normally from now on. Okay, back to our custom audio file on the desktop. We're going to change the extension name on the file from M4A to M4R. You'll be asked to confirm the changes and we'll use M4R. Now for Windows users, you'll need to go to your control panel, then choose appearance and personalization, select the folder options, and in the view tab, make sure you've unchecked the box to hide extensions for known file types. That will allow you to see and change the file type. Okay, we're almost there, but before you bring your ringtone back into iTunes, you have to delete the custom version that we initially created, and if you don't do this, iTunes will not accept the ringtone, so this is an important and crucial step. Once you've done that, drag and drop the renamed M4R file into the source column of iTunes, and the word library should highlight. It will copy the file into iTunes, check out the ringtone section, and voila, you have a new ringtone. Plug in your phone into your computer, make sure you set it up to sync the ringtones in the appropriate section, and your custom tones will be synced to your phone. Now the final step is to take your iOS device, go into your settings, then sounds, and we already know about ringtones, so this time let's go to your text tones, and you'll be able to choose your default sound of choice from the ones you've created, and if you want even more customization, you can go into your contacts and set specific ringtones and text tones for your friends. I'm Brian Tong with your how-to for custom ringtones and text tones for iOS 5. There's no reason for you to pay money when you can do it this way. Hey, Chewbacca just texted me. Use it wisely. Please, I beg of you, don't get too carried away with your text tones. We just learned a few weeks ago that some of you are texting over 40 times a day. I don't need to hear a Katy Perry song every time you do, and no Bieber. Or if you would like to take a moment to set your phone to vibrate, I'll give you the chance to do that during this break. We'll be back with more tech review right after this. Welcome back to the CNET Tech Review, our weekly video digest of all things good and bad we've seen here at CNET TV. Continuing on in the good, the Ultrabooks are coming. Intel announced support for this new category of ultra-thin Intel-powered laptops that would compete with MacBook Airs, and they are starting to appear. Lenovo's new IdeaPad is possibly the best looking of the bunch. Let's have a look. I'm Dan Ackerman and we are here taking a look at the Lenovo IdeaPad U300S. Now this is another one of the new laptops in the subcategory known as the Ultrabook. That's an Intel invented uh, term that refers to laptops that are very thin, very light, still pretty powerful, good battery life, kind of like a Windows version of the MacBook Air. And we've seen a couple of them that are uh, the same price as the MacBook Air, some that are uh, significantly less expensive. Uh, this model right here comes in two different configurations. Uh, the one that matches up with the entry-level MacBook Air uh, has a 128-gig solid-state hard drive, a Core i5 CPU from Intel. Uh, if you go with that setup, uh, the Lenovo U300S is actually $100 cheaper than the MacBook Air. And you know what? This is probably one of the nicer looking uh, Windows laptops we've ever seen. So that actually seems like a, a pretty good deal, especially uh, if, if you think that this includes things like an HDMI output, USB 3.0, things you're not going to get on the MacBook Air. This exact model sitting right in front of us, however, is the more expensive version. This has a big 256 gig SSD drive and a Core i7 TPU, uh, very powerful, very enviable stuff. That actually works out to be uh, $1599, the exact same as uh, the 13-inch MacBook Air that has that bigger hard drive and that faster CPU. If they're exactly the same price, I don't know, I still might be tempted to go with the uh, MacBook Air just because that's such a, a, a great all-together uh, system and, and the design and the touchpad and the keyboard, everything works fantastically on that. Now on this model, uh, much like we see with a lot of other Lenovo's, the keyboard is excellent. It's got a nice big touchpad. Uh, the keys have that Lenovo IdeaPad thing where they curve out just a tiny bit at the bottom. I find that helps with some of my sloppy typing. I kind of catch the bottom edge of the key uh, where normally on a perfectly squared off key, I'd miss it. Uh, one knock that we've got is the 13-inch screen. Native resolution is 1366 by 768. That's perfectly normal for a 13-inch laptop. But when you get up to this price range, you kind of want something a little bit, uh, a little bit nicer. Maybe a 16 by 9. Even the MacBook Air uh, is uh, is a 1440 by 900. Slight difference there because that's a 16 by 10 versus 
16 by 9. Uh, design on this, however, is really great. It's super thin, super light. When you close it, it kind of looks almost like a book from the side. It's got the little lips kind of stick out a tiny bit. Uh, the body is stamped from a single piece of aluminum, and as you can see, there are no vents on the bottom. It actually uses uh, some very subtle vents here on the side, and they claim that the keyboard actually acts as a venting system itself, letting heat out through the keys, although we certainly didn't suffer any hot finger while uh, typing on it. This Ultrabook concept is still unproven, but if we see more systems that cost the same or hopefully less than a MacBook Air and that look and work as nicely as this one, uh, I think there's a lot of legs there. And going into next year, the year after that, hopefully we'll see a lot more super thin systems like that that will even become the basic standard for laptops of all sizes. I'm Dan Ackerman, and that is the Lenovo IdeaPad U300S. I admit I was skeptical of this fleet of MacBook Air killers, but it looks like Intel could be onto something after all. Also, I like that burnt umber color. I like this. But now let's turn our attention to less promising devices in the bad. A fleet of MacBook Air killers might be possible, but the fleet of would-be iPad killers is pretty much a sinking proposition. And none are sinking faster than this Fusion Garage thing. I love new and innovative tech. Well, at least I'm supposed to love new and innovative tech, right? We're all supposed to love new and innovative things, but the truth is we only love new and innovative when it's actually well executed. Hi, I'm Eric Franklin, and today we're taking a first look at the Fusion Garage Grid 10 tablet. The Grid 10 has a unique UI, but okay, I won't bury the lead. It's not well executed. First off, there's no home or back button, virtual or otherwise. Instead, you have to use two finger swipes for those commands. Swiping to the left takes you back, and swiping down from the top takes you home. Now, I'd rather have actual or virtual buttons do this, but this way works fine too, as long as the tablet is laid down on a surface. Trying to swipe with two fingers while holding the tablet makes for a finger cramping experience though. Also, the Grit 10's angular pointy corners make it uncomfortable to hold, and we have the bruises in our palms to prove it. Okay, we don't have bruises, but those corners really do dig into the palms. This brings us to the way the Grid 10 handles navigation to apps. Apps are grouped into different clusters, and the clusters are by default expanded and spread across the screen. It seems to be Fusion Garage's solution for having to flip through pages of apps like on a typical tablet, and works a lot like the way folders do on an iPad. Luckily, you can edit the grid so that the clusters are closer together, making them easier to find. Once they're all expanded, however, it becomes difficult to find the cluster and therefore the app you need quickly. There's a little mini-map in the corner to help, but the fact that there's a map to help you navigate the interface leaves even more credence to the idea that the interface needed more work before release. Features-wise, the left side of the tablet hosts a headphone jack, a 40-pin connector for power and connecting to a PC, a micro SD card slot and holes for the speakers. On the opposite edge are more speaker holes, a micro SIM slot, unusable in our Wi-Fi version, and a power button with a white LED light. The front side includes a low quality 1.2 megapixel camera. Performance wise, navigating and launching apps seems more sluggish than on other tablets. Also, the screen doesn't rotate to align when in an upside down horizontal position, which is kind of weird and the screen has a low brightness and darkens severely when viewed from the right side. Though innovative, the Grid 10 is severely held back by its user interface. This overly complex, inefficient UI with its ridiculously unnecessary two-finger swipe navigation is clunky to use, performs sluggishly, and feels unfinished. There is potential here, but not enough to warrant a recommendation. Once again, I'm Eric Franklin, and this has been a first look at the Fusion Garage Grid 10. So that's not shooting to the top of any holiday lists. Sometimes multi-touch is just a little too multi. Sorry guys. Actually, let's give them a break and move right along to this week's bottom line. If the Fusion Garage Grid 10 was trying to be innovative, the Lytro camera really is innovative. I've been excited about this light field camera since it was announced back in June, and I'm even more excited now that Lytro has shown off some working prototypes. 
Hey guys, Brian Song here with CNET TV, and we have a first look at the Lytro camera. This is the first ever light field camera. Now, you see this design, it's really unique. It's not a traditional camera because this camera does not do traditional things. So, when you talk about your standard digital cameras, you know, you focus on one, one angle, one specific amount of light, focus on a, on a subject. But here, this captures everything. A light field sensor captures all the light information in the picture. So, what I'm going to do here is kind of show you an example. We're going to take this camera right here now. And we're going to just go up really close. The beauty of this, you do not need a focus. I know it doesn't sound like it could happen, but you don't need to focus on the picture. I just snap it instantly, and I have this dinosaur right here in the forefront. Now, some of the specs inside of this camera, it includes an 8x optical zoom, an f2 constant aperture, really unheard of in any kind of camera at this size. And what you can do once you have the pictures in here is you'll plug it into your computer, your PC, or your Mac. The software that comes included allows you to manipulate the picture. So no matter what I take right now, after the fact, I'll be able to choose what I want to focus on. So I mean, like I said, really crazy, amazing stuff. Now, if you look at the form factor on here, there's not too many buttons. There's really not many buttons at all. You have your standard power button. You also have your shutter button. It's an instant shutter. And you have here up on the top, if you kind of slide back and forth, you'll have a zoom. What also makes this product unique is that this glass screen in the back, this is a touch screen that allows you to interact with the pictures just like you interact with it on your computer. So you can swipe left or right to see some of the previous pictures you've taken. And then what's the beauty of this is in the camera, the software is all there, which enables you to pick a focal point and then it focuses it on the camera. Just some really amazing stuff where, again, you don't need to focus when you take your picture. So the big question is, when are these going to be available? You can jump on Elytro.com's website. There's a few models out there, the graphite and the aqua blue color. They'll be going for eight gigs at $399. And then if you talk about the red hot model, that's going to be a 16 gig model for $499. But they'll be starting to ship early sometime in 2012. But uh, overall, this is just some really killer technology. First time we've ever seen it, bringing it to you in your living room. I'm Brian Tong for CNET TV with a first look at the Lytro camera. The bottom line this week, now every side is your good side. It's not often that a technology appears that's actually all new, exciting, and pretty affordable. As for that lipstick case design, hey, if that's what it takes to accommodate mega ray optics, I am fine with it. I ordered mine in blue. All right, that's going to do it for this time, but come back next week for an all-new CNET Tech Review. Until then, there are tons of great videos available every day at CNETTV.com. I'll see you next time, and thank you for watching.